Good afternoon, my name is Emilio Chiodo. I am assistant professor at the University of Teramo in the Abruzzo region in Italy. And this research has been developed with the colleagues uh, Andrea Fantini and Rita Salvatore of University of Teramo and with Giulia Cuello de Souza of the Federal University of Santa Catarina in Brazil and Daniela Pedrasani uh, of the University of Contestado in the Santa Catarina state uh, in Brazil. Uh, this uh, research uh, wants to show uh, some aspects of the agritourism in the Santa Catarina state in Brazil and is part of a broader research project within an international survey uh, group that uh, is uh, IORINA, International Research Network uh, for Agritourism. The research was conducted through an online questionnaire and we collected 118 questionnaires from agritourism companies in the Santa Catarina state. And the analysis is focused on the comparison uh, between the results of two groups of agritourism, uh, the members of an important agritourism association of organic producers that is called Acolida na Colonia, and uh, the other agritourism of uh, the region of the Contestado uh, area in the same uh, in the same state that are not members of this association. Santa Catarina State is located in the south of Brazil. 16% uh, of the population uh, lives in rural areas and uh, the predominant geography uh, are mountain and slopes uh, that, uh, favor, that, uh, that could favor the family farming and the production based on the level force instead of the uh, agricultural mechanization. Uh, a big part of the state is covered by forest uh, with a specific uh, hot spot of biodiversity called Mata Atlantica. The state has been also characterized by a mass migration from Italy and Germany, mainly in the rural areas, and uh, these immigrants uh, defined uh, the sociocultural characteristics of the state and shape the important material and immaterial heritage, and also uh, some social aspects as the creation of cooperatives and association, associations mainly linked to rural production and uh, social reproduction of family farming. One of these is uh, a colida na colonia that involves uh, at the moment uh, uh, 95 family farmers in the Santa Catarina state producing organic products and practicing uh, agroecology. Uh, the association was founded in uh, 1991 and uh, it's uh, organized in seven regional uh, groups and associates farmers with traditional and ecological farming systems uh, organized in local network of production, consumption, and selling, and also offering uh, agritourist attractions oriented to environmental education, culinary education, and uh, uh, production of orchards. The, the objectives of the, of the association is to strengthen uh, the Brazilian agritourist model based on family farming and on direct organic production selling, according to a national marketing approach. 80 agritourist companies was inter were interviewed within uh, this association. The other 38 agritourists are located in the uh, Planalto uh, Norte Catarinense and Planorte that is a group of 10 municipalities in the north of the state, also organized in a, in a municipality association. Uh, in this area, the main agricultural products are corn, barley, tobacco, and soybeans. And this area is an important uh, uh, producing area in the state, but it's also an important tourist uh, uh, attraction area 
called a valid or contestado. So uh, the objectives of uh, this uh, research was the comparison between these two groups of agriculturists, one, or one organized in association, the other not. In the second group, uh, uh, we could uh, interview uh, 38 uh, uh, agriculturists. Uh, what is the theoretical framework of our project, uh, our hypothesis, is that agritourism can be an instrument of social innovation because agritourism is slowly moving uh, uh, from a model of uh, only diversification and integration of the uh, farmer's income towards a more complex model uh, where mot farmers' motivation are not only economic, but are also social, environmental, and cultural, and also oriented towards a more comprehensive idea of uh, community development and sustainable tourism, where farmers are committed with the uh, requalification of the territory, and also with the uh, redefinition of the uh, relationships with the uh, general uh, food market. The survey investigates a wide range of aspects, uh, starting from the products and the services offered, on the relationships with visitors and the organizational aspects, but also uh, try to focus on farmers' motivations and goals uh, on the elements of success, on future plans, on barriers, and on the supporting elements, both at company and territorial element uh, level, and also try to uh, to to have a, a, an economic point of view, considering uh, the the revenues, the costs of the activities, and the impact of the uh, COVID nineteen pandemic. Uh, the survey has been realized to an online questionnaire, uh, both uh, sent by email and uh, filled by uh, specialized interviewers uh, through uh, telephone calls. Uh, we can start the comparison between the two groups. Uh, in, the, in the left graph, we can see the farmer's age, the percentage of women that is higher in the Colidana Colonia group, and also the dimension that is a little bit higher in the in this first group. But what is uh, really distinguishing the two groups are the, the services that are offered, because the agritourism that are associated uh, to a colida and a colonia uh, are, uh, provide a higher number of, uh, of services. We can see the difference in accommodation, in educational activities, in the organization of events, uh, of uh, outdoor recreation activities, uh, in of, uh, for farm direct sales, and also in uh, uh, providing food to, uh, to the guests. Uh, if we look to the motivations and the goals, uh, we can see that uh, the highest motivation of the farmers uh, uh, that uh, are associated in Colina Colonia is the increasing of the agritourism profits, but also a very high uh, score on a, a five point scale has uh, the motivation of improving the quality of life of the community. Uh, on the other side, we can see that uh, in the Contestado Agritourism that are not associated in the Acolida Association uh, is more important encouraging uh, the social interaction with the public. Other important motivations we have uh, seen that, uh, on the contrary, are not uh, able to differentiate the two groups are the, the the possibility to provide family employment and also to raise uh, public awareness about uh, uh, agricultural issues. Uh, about the economic dimension of the, the two groups, uh, you can see that the majority of the, uh, uh, of the companies 
are uh, of small dimension. So the, the economic dimension is uh, lower than 30,000 US dollars. And some uh, members of a political colonia are characterized by a higher economic dimension, mainly due to the higher range of service offered in comparison with uh, the others. The impact of the pandemic. Uh, the impact of the pandemic uh, has been uh, very high in both groups and unfortunately has been higher in the more diversified uh, agritourism, in the agritourism that uh, uh, offered more uh, a broader range of, uh, of services. So the higher uh, percentage of decrease has been registered in the offering of entertainment and events, in educational services, in the excursions and outdoor recreation, and also in the overnight uh, stays. So unfortunately, the most uh, diversified farms uh, have been the most affected by uh, the pandemic. So how to sort of this uh, sort out of this uh, situation uh, we have asked uh, which uh, are which uh, have been the institutions that uh, uh, could provide some help in uh, in uh, in overcoming the the crisis uh, linked to the due to the pandemic and uh, we can see that the, the answers are uh, <clears throat> uh, quite uh, quite different between the two groups so we can uh, both uh, uh, rely on the producers organizations and also on national support agencies as an institution that can provide some uh, some help but for example in the colina colonia uh, group uh, is underlined the importance of uh, uh, tourism organization in uh, helping uh, uh, agritourism in, uh, in uh, recuperating uh, their uh, their role after the the pandemic and also uh, <clears throat> even if with a lower score we can see uh, the, the importance of uh, the public, national, or international uh, institutions and the university extension services uh, at a lower level and with a lot of uh, answers that, uh, that say, I, I don't know, you can find the role of uh, non-profit associations and also of paid uh, consultants. We tried also to 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 analyze uh, in a deep way these differences, uh, applying a, a logistic regression model, a multivariate analysis, to to try to find if it is possible to divide uh, in an effective way uh, these two groups and to find uh, the differences. The logistic regression model directly estimates the probability of an event occurring. In this case, the event is uh, the single agritourism associated or not to a Colida and a Colonia Association. Uh, the, I, I don't want to describe uh, in the details uh, the model but we find a fair, uh, fair quality results of the model and we can see that some variables are able to uh, discriminate between uh, the two groups uh, with the capacity to correctly classify the 80% of uh, the cases. These variables are the, the kind of production, the relevance of cash flow management, the dimension in hectares, and also the uh, usefulness of universities extension services 
during the COVID pandemic. We know that this is not enough, so we we want to go deeper in this in this analysis, even if uh, the uh, the outcome has a satisfactory statistical uh, uh, result able to put in evidence that there are two different contexts and uh, the structural and production aspects are relevant for the model identification and also some management aspects and perceptions real, uh, relative to the pandemic crisis also contribute to differentiate the farmer's behavior. Of course, we need to integrate the multivariate analysis with the descriptive one and to, with the qualitative one in trying to better interpret the challenges and opportunities for uh, the agritourism in the Santa Catarina state. <coughs> Uh, some uh, conclusions and <clears throat> further research paths. The associated agritourism companies provide a higher range of services based on farm diversification compared with non-associated ones. It is possible through multivariate analysis to differentiate the two groups with uh, a significant uh, results, but we need uh, improvements in the model just to better clarify the differences. Uh, what is important is that the association to an existing and active organization, and also an organization that is strongly oriented towards an ecological identity, uh, can provide a difference in the capability of offering services and also in diversifying and increasing incomes. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic seemed to hit more severely uh, the more differentiating companies. And uh, in this case, it's very important to identify uh, the type of intervention that institutions can uh, realize in order to address and overcome the pandemic. Uh, also in this case, the perception that uh, agritourism farmers uh, have of of their role is not uh, enough uh, distinctly identifiable. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. If you want to know more about this uh, international group and uh, this international agri survey on agritourism, there will be a round table on September 1st. Thank you. With us. Hello to everybody. Can you hear me? My name is Will Keller. I'm with Clemson University, Clemson Extension. And let me make sure this works. And I'm not good at standing directly behind a podium the whole time. So to excuse me if I get away from the microphone, yell at me at least fine. Um, 
I did give a, a, a rack card for everybody on the front. It's just got a really good rundown of my research here. Uh, what, what I did, the intergenerational study of the entrepreneurial nature of agritourism operators. And on the back, it's got my contact information. The uh, QR code takes you directly to my profile. Uh, please feel free to email and ask any questions anytime, any place. Okay, other button, okay. So. Get that updated here. Yeah, I got it. I got it. Got it. So, uh, so I'm going to start out today. I'm going to go by on the presentation on this research I did. I'm going to talk about the why, the, the what, uh, the idea. Uh, first, I'll talk about the why, then the idea, then the what. I'm going to talk about the background information found. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the recommendations. So uh, economic, non-economic, uh, global uh, issues. Are, are causing people to go to agritourism. We know that we've seen that. Agritourism has grown tremendously uh, worldwide, globally. Um, at the same time, trainers, and this is through the background research, trainers have become aware that there are generational differences in workers, uh, a lot of generational differences in workers. You've got companies that are hiring specific uh, consultants to come in and help them deal with the Gen Z and the millennials and you know whoever else is out there. So a lot of issues there. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to take a look. Okay, let's take a look at generational cohort, ana cohort analysis. Um, there's a lot of back and forth about the, the 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 validity of generational cohort analysis. I think for this for what I did in this in this research, it is very valid, and it was proved in a number of different other articles around tourism and some other things that it was going to be a good good study. And I think it did. And I think I proved some good good things here. Um, so the age of the primary farm operator was, you know, was found to be positively associated with the importance of agritourism. So I started to want to look at, okay, I'm going to look at goals around this. I want to look at some of the benefits and perceived benefits, motivations. Uh, at the same time, work characteristics were found to be not equally represented uh, within different generational cohorts of workers. So that's, you know, something maybe I can look at work characteristics too. What I did was I called the work characteristics and entrepreneurial goals. That's your, that's your, that's your entre or work characteristics and goals is your entrepreneurial nature. So I looked at the entrepreneurial nature of the agritourism operator. And that was how I, I came up through that. Um, specifically, what I did here was I sought to better understand the entrepreneurial nature of the agritourism operator by investigating differences in agritourism operators' entrepreneurial goals and work characteristics among age cohorts. Very, very simple. The idea is by doing this, it's gonna assist service providers in providing support for those agritourism operators. And I think it, it, it's done that. Um, I'm going through that. Failure to incorporate, you know, failure to incorporate age specific entrepreneurial goals and work characteristics may limit the ability of academics, researchers, service providers, extension educators, uh, to deliver adequate support, uh, you know, you've got to actually design that program. And by taking into account the, uh, the age of the, uh, the generational cohort of the of the agritourism operator, you can assist doing that. So, specifically, the study utilized the generational cohort theory uh, to investigate entrepreneurial goals and work characteristics by age cohort. And what I did was I looked at millennials, Generation X, baby boomers, and silent generation. Um, the reason why I did not include the Gen Z in this was because it just wasn't a, a, a number enough of them involved with actually running and owning an agritourism operation at this point. That is going to change, that is changing. I see, I see that changing in the next five to 10 years. Uh, the reason why I did include silent generation is specifically because of the age of the average farmer. I mean, everyone knows that, it's up there. And I'm glad I did because those numbers were, were pretty decent. Um, so, um, yeah, I can show those numbers in a second. Um, entrepreneurial goals here were defined as perceived benefits and motivations. I used uh, some of the work done by Two and Barbieri in 2012, to design my own scale around that. Some of the work characteristics here are, are defined as the content and organization of one's work task activities, relationships, and responsibilities. And I used work around from Hermes and Vokak and, and Morgison and Humphrey around the work design questionnaire that they have got. And the work design questionnaire has been used in a number of different areas, specific around, specifically around um, work uh, characteristics and, 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 and 
by consultants, but I wanted to I wanted to see are there any different work characteristics of agronism operators? Do they differ among age? And actually, I found that they did not in, through this study. Um, and then, of course, like I mentioned, generational core theory it is justified in numerous aspects such as consumer behavior in the literature and consumer behavior, communication, workplace values, and even tourism. So I went ahead and went that way with, with generational cohort theory. Um, a lot of stuff out there that kind of debunks generational cohort theory, you know, claiming that it's just actually age progression. Um, I, I, I disagree with a lot of that. So, am I not? Okay, yeah. Um, I'll go there. Yeah. The doctrinal goals of the agritourism operator, we just talked about that. And I, I apologize, I was on my computer. Um, so, yeah. Tested the hypothesis that agritourism operators and entrepreneurial goals and work characteristics differ by age forward. I mentioned that. Um, agritourism operators were specifically born between 1928 and 1996. So, that's your, that's your, what we were talking about the millennials to your silent generation. Um, I gathered background information. First, got the background information on the goals and the work characteristics for my scales um, using a national survey. Then I used measures of central tendency and used measures of variability to describe the data sets characteristics before using statistical models that I, that I designed uh, to draw conclusions about the relationships. So it, um, it, it all came down to it, really the background information was, was fascinating to me. The, uh, the, the statistical models did prove a few Pretty, pretty neat thing, so I can go through. Uh, specifically, there was 414 survey results from 47 states. Um, and those 47 states included everywhere except for, where, where except for New Mexico, Wyoming, and Arizona. Um, did not get results back from there. Uh, this 414 survey respondents though, at the time when I started this project, this was in 2020 and then 2021, um, there was no national survey of agritourism operators out. Um, there has been since been a couple of national surveys, but there was no, none at the time, there was no national database of agritourism operators at that time either. So I used a, uh, a, a, a contact through a travel agency that provided me with a list of 14,000 email addresses of potential agritourism operators. Um, as you can expect, blind email addresses of potential agritourism operators <laughs> You know, my results may not be the best in the world, but I went ahead and went and chugged ahead and went through it and did it. And um, getting 414 survey respondents was amazing to me because I, I, you know, according to what I needed, I needed 384 for the national study and that worked out really, really well. So um, pretty cool stuff. And then when I started looking at the, the results, um, some of these farms are just actually made. A lot of them I know about, a lot of them I see here, uh, but some pretty amazing farms that uh, from a pretty amazing areas. Some cool, cool background information here, 55%, over 50% were baby boomers. Um, pretty neat. Obviously it's kind of, these are the farmers, these are the older farmers that still have their farms. Um, the baby boomers are out there. Um, that's changing. The Gen X is actually coming on pretty strong. Uh, the, the next category down was Gen X. They had over 30%. And then you've got the millennials. And then there was only 9% silent generation kind of to be expected, that's your 76 up and above. Um, so kind of to be expected, but they're still out there. Um, I expect the millennials to be a little higher because we've seen a lot of younger, even college graduate trying to start small farms, wanting to do agritourism first and foremost. We see a lot of that, especially around the Southeast. So 55% were female. This one, or this number was pretty cool. I was like, okay, so I looked into it a little further. Um, Compared to the, the U.S., all farm operators is around 35% female. So this is pretty neat, pretty neat to look at. One thing I did find was between 2012, according to the USA, in 2012 and 2017, uh, the number of agri the number of female farm workers has gone up 27%, and that number is expected to continue growing, and it's going to grow because of the changing roles of women in agriculture right now, and it's going to keep going up. So I do expect this number to even go up. Um, women are going to control agritourism before we know it. So it's pretty neat stuff. 75% um, of all, 75% you know, of the farms offer farm and educational 
tours as part of their agritourism operation. This one, I really, I threw this one up there because I, I thought this one was really, really, really neat. Um, you know, a, a farmer agriculture tour, educational tour can be defined pretty broadly, but you know, this is very important. And this goes to show, and I can link this back to some of my uh, analysis results and I, I will in a second. This goes to show you that education is out there. People are doing agritourism because they want to pass the knowledge on to the next generation or the generation after that or whoever. So pretty good stuff. So more about these, so more about these background information. Uh, I just mentioned educating the public about agriculture was highest importance among all age groups. So that's not even just, okay, oh, goodness gracious. Not, yeah, thanks. Uh, among all age groups, farm experience and knowledge driven activities were dominant among agritourism operators. Pretty good stuff, knowledge driven. Uh, nearly 20 years uh, at the current agritourism location, which is very comparable to all farms, which is around 21. Uh, average size is 216. All farms in the United States is around 440, but that kind of can be expected with corporate farms, large farms. So average size uh, over which 58 or roughly 60 is dedicated agriculture. Large majority of respondents, 82% did not participate in the trail. I threw this in there because I have a lot of interest in ag trails. So that was interesting to me. And I think that could be an area that definitely warrants further, further investigation. Um, Higher percentage of agriculture with females, we mentioned that. And then I did have some COVID questions in there and I thought this was actually expected and it came out just like we expected, but you know, more operations saw an increase in visits than a decrease during those years. This was 2020, 2021. So more saw an increase. Um, let's kind of roll through this pretty quick. The, the statistical analysis came back. Entrepreneurial goals are not equally represented among different generational cohorts of agritourism operators, uh, specifically, among the variable group market opportunities. Um, so, and my results, like you said, I've got, you got the profile, you can dig into some of this a little more. There is a divide between older generations and younger generations of agritourism operators who are going values and preferences specific to the workplace. Um, and, and I can tell you what we found overwhelmingly was that baby boomers, they want education. They're doing this all about education could be expected, they're already financially stable and somewhat. And then, then millennials are all about making money and that's to be expected. So, hey, um, going findings further confirm the validity of applying GCT and I, and I would actually use this for other things. Um, let me skip this one real quick. I've got one minute left. Recommendations for future research, you know, building on the study, I would love, you know, I, I use really a quick stab at this just running a quantitative analysis, straight basic. I'd love to see this qualitative. I'd love to get a great study going out there. A number of different methods of qualitative analysis. Um, sampling frame, you know, I use that that uh, email addresses and threw them out there through, through darts on the board and hit 414, which is fantastic in 47 states. I'd like to see a better sampling frame and let's see if we can really link up this stuff. Um, lens. You know, you don't have to use generational core theory in this stuff. And I would love to see some environmental responsible agritourism or agriculture. So gender equity, let's use that as a lens. Let's use social justice, educating the public. You know, how, how can we do that? I think there's great minds that could really put that together. Um, and thank you guys. That's me. And uh, that's it. So again, QR codes there. Um, if you need me, get to me. So thank you. What was that three minutes? You gave me five minutes. Yeah, man. we have five more minutes for Q and A. So okay. if there's no questions, you can go back and do the other slide. Okay. Okay. Right. So, what well, we got? I was curious which states. I couldn't tell exactly that. Which I'll, states did you yeah, the most? I'm sorry. Yeah, New Mexico. Oh, the most. The no. most. I'm sorry. Yeah, and someone asked me that last night. The most number one was California. Yeah. To be expected. Uh, the number two was North Carolina. Oh. North Carolina has a vibrant, vibrant agritourism association that that started with their uh a great uh great lady a long time ago so it's it, our north carolina is really rock and rolling with that um so yeah north carolina and then then there was a typical there was a minnesota had a great many ohio and some others illinois had a great many now were you able to like create a like equal playing field by doing that ratio of total farms and those i did i did not i did not not, not with that. I didn't take that 
apart. And I didn't separate the, the states like that. So no, I didn't. Did you get any other demographic information? I did. I got. I did. I got a great bit of information. You can find it on, on the profile. We can, we can go through some of that stuff, but I did get other gen demographic information. Um, um, Obviously age, yeah, I mean, racial information, age. others, you know, race, I mean, it, it was, and it all, most of it that I did not include up there was very typical of, you know, all the farm, yeah. all farm. It was, you know, very, very, very similar to all farm. So, um, just to follow up, what, what kind of percentage are you seeing of African-American and Latino? There was, there was, it was, it was like 97% white on this, my, on this study, which was, you know, um, when you look at all farm, it's very, very, very similar there. So, yeah. 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 I, I, there was, there was some, and there was some from, I think China had a good bit. And, and like in China, they don't have the same generational courts we do. They have to define it because obviously they don't have the same background. I mean, generational court theory is the experiences that you've gone through. And, and so they have different experiences in China. I mean, they don't have the same things we've gone through, you know, at your age here in the United States. So and China did that and they looked at, they looked at some very similar, um, how the older and the younger generations treat one another in a big, big way. There was a lot of ageism research around that specific to ag, which was pretty good, specific to tourism, which is pretty good. So yeah, that was some pretty neat stuff. And Hawaii had one farm and, um, which was, um, and pretty good, but that, that actually turned out to be my 4-H agent in my office is from Hawaii, and that was her family. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, so, yeah. Anyway. If we could make people realize something they think about. Yeah. 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 No. Yeah. I can just ask for the questions to go up to the mic too. I, I apologize for mentioning that before for our online audience. So, if you have a question, or I'll bring the mic to you. I can bring the mic. To who else? Or you can repeat the question. Yeah, I'll do that. Okay. Easy. Yes. So, Will, you said that um, you could repeat the survey assignments, but that you or put it out before that there was really no good listing of any tourism operators. Is there one out there now? The, yeah, there was no, and you're asking if there was, is, is there a good listing of agritourism operators now? Um, there's some, I think, you know, Lisa Chase has just done a, a, a study um, on national study and they, they utilize, they did it differently. They used a lot of number, utilized a number of partners from all the states and those partners provided list of agritourism operators. That's a great way to do it. Um, I, I didn't, you know, that, that's just one way to do it. But yeah, there's, there's some list out there. I would love to see a comprehensive list database that's put together um, that we can use, we can all come together and do that. I think that that's next steps. Um, obviously, I think someone like um, like Anathema or someone like that needs to needs to make that happen. So, yeah, good question. Maybe we have time for one more question. If there are any more, yes. Sorry, I came in late. I was in another session, but oh. I don't know if you dealt with it. But how did you treat the definition of agritourism? <laughs> Did you? Ooh, that's a loaded question. My goodness. Um, and, and I know, and this is a, a touchy point for this study. I said, you had to be a working farm. You had to be located at a working farm. Um, agritourism encompasses so many things, you know, so many, you know, can encompass. Some people say it's a farm stand. Some people say it's a ag museums. I mean, there's just so much around that. Is it ag education? Is it agritainment? Is it agri leisure? Is it agri experience? There's so much stuff around that. Um, I just, I, I made it, you know, one of my questions in my survey was, are you a working farm? Are you located on a working farm? And so that's where it, that's where it came from. Yeah, but great question, great question. Thank you so much. Thank you. is focused on uh, entrepreneur, entrepreneurial motivations of agritourism farmers on analysis of USA farms and ranches. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. So we've got another Clemson person up here. Go Tigers. Um, 
So my name is Lori Dickus. I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm from Clemson University. Um, I'm a faculty member at Clemson and uh, my focus area has been rural and regional economic development. So that's kind of the lens that I come at this and I've focused a lot in, on my research in entrepreneurship. So that's um, where some of this comes from. And Tim Tope was one of my graduate students who was successful um, at graduating. So um, I'm, I'm here in support of her work as well. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about the origin of this, but Will mentioned that um, Lisa Chase and colleagues had done a national survey. So that's where this data is coming from. And I'll tell you just a, a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, and as you can see, there's a whole list of colleagues that have helped with this work. And there's a number of other spinoff uh, projects that are happening with this work that I'm happy to share more about. There's some really great qualitative research coming out right now around gender, um, as well as legacy issues of farms and things like that. So I'm happy to talk more about that. Um, so go ahead, if you will. Oh, I guess I can click. Okay. <laughs> um, so just the framework of my presentation, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the motivations for it um, and kind of how I got to this idea. Um, a little, very, very briefly on the literature, some, what's the core objective of the research, um, the model summary, but I don't want to get into much of the weeds <laughs> with the model um, results, uh, discussion, and kind of where next, what our next steps are. Ah, thank you. Okay. I'm very visual, so I have a lot more visuals than I have words uh, on the screen. So where did this come from? What are the ideas? So you all know, you're all here at this conference because you're interested in agritourism in some way, um, and it's growing, right? We all know that it's growing. It's a growing sector in the U.S. It's a really critical part of our rural economies. And so while, you know, agritourism revenue as a part of overall farm revenue um, may not be a huge substantive part, it is growing and it's growing quite rapidly. So as such, when I think of that, I think of, wow, that's a primary driver then, or it's a key driver of economic growth for a rural community potentially. So how does that then contribute to rural economic growth and development? That's what I would think about. And so, you know, the agritourism literature um, documents lots of different reasons, motivations for agritourism, entrepreneurship. And I'm going to call it that because I really do think that whether, whether entrepreneurs, whether traditional entrepreneurs <laughs> would call agritourism operators entrepreneurs, I'm leaving that aside. They're entrepreneurs. They're running businesses. That's what they're doing, right? Um, and so that's the lens that I come at this with. But the rationales are many, right? It, not, it is not just economic. It is economic, but it's not just economics, right? It might be to sustain the existing farming business, to diversify a range of farm oper operations, to diversify farm research, uh, excuse me, farm resources, improve quality of life, education, uh, provide sustainability education, et cetera. So there's a whole range of rationales. You know, the research also shows that there are, that consumers and suppliers or agritourism operators come at these things from both a, a supply and a demand side, right? So the demand side, visitors come to agritourism similar to the way they would come to any tourism um, kind of demand situation, right? They're there, whether it's for a couple hours, a day, or three days, right? There is this kind of touristic element to that, their participation. And so that includes, you know, what's the value? Um, are there places to eat and drink? Are there places to stay maybe, right? Is it a convenient location? All of these types of things. And then of course, the supply side, there's all kinds of motivations and rationales um, in which agritourism operators come to that. So one of the questions, one of the ongoing questions we had in thinking about the literature from this, from the literature around this issue and then surveying and talking to farmers is what is the relationship between the motivations of agritourism operators or agritourism entrepreneurs and their profitability? But specifically, we were really interested in motivations from traditional entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship research. Um, and we wanted to bring in a theoretical lens that maybe was a little bit unique. So you all have heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Who has heard of that, right? And so one of the things that you hear time and time again in agritourism work is, 
this need for livelihood enhancement, right? Additional income or additional income to support traditional farm operations, et cetera. Um, in addition to other, this whole range of other things. And so we really wanted to look at these motivating forces more broadly. So when you look, I think there might be, if you click it again, there might, yeah, okay, thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't, <laughs> I hate when those things like fly in, but, um, um, so when you look at Maslow's hierarchy needs, you've all seen this before, so I don't need to describe this, but what I really want to focus on is these characteristics on the side, right? So your motivation decreases the more your needs are met, the more your basic needs are met, okay? Um, so, um, so at a decreasing rate. So being... But once you get to the self-actualization are these growth needs. So anything below self-actualization is considered a deficiency need, meaning you have to figure out how to fill that up, right? And then the growth needs is, is beyond that. So one of the things we were really curious about is what are the motivations of a agritourism entrepreneur from the perspective of, are they trying to fill deficiency needs first, or are they simultaneously also trying to fill growth or esteem needs, i.e., I want to educate my community, I want to contribute to local community development, right, needs that might be beyond the immediate sort of traditional economic function, um, or what might be termed more self-interested function, and so we were really curious about that, and so wanted to figure out how we could frame that. Well, there was a way we could frame that using um, a, uh, an, a model that was developed in the management literature by Shane et al., who looks at motivations of entrepreneurs from three primary lenses in which he has a number of different indicators for these lenses, um, these indices, if you will. So he has motivation, traditional motivation, uh, the environment around the, the individual or the organization and cognitive factors of the individual or individuals involved. And so <laughs> excuse me. This, um, the, these indices allowed us to think a little bit more about, okay, well, how can we test this then? How can we test um, this idea of what is driving agritourism operators um, from this motivating lens, right? So if you, if you go back then to the Maslow idea, so, um, excuse me, let me come back to that. So you see over here, the origin then is, we're assuming agritourism operators are entrepreneurial, right? We're assuming maybe um, agritourism differs a little bit from um, general entrepreneurship theory literature, uh, but we also know that there is this entrepreneurship element, and we know that from some of the drivers of agritourism. So put all this together with this framework, and then we're going to try to test um, this idea of what are these motivating factors for our agritourism entrepreneurs. So the primary objective of the paper then. So the primary objective is to investigate if the motivation for higher level needs in agritourism, so i.e., um, you know, self-efficacy, esteem, et cetera, um, which moves you theoretically up to this growth um, self-actualization phase um, increases when lower level needs are filled, okay? Maybe that's kind of a duh, but um, we were curious if we could actually illustrate that and sort of prove it, if you will. So the hypothesis around that is that agritourism operators to some degree satisfy deficiency needs before growth needs, which is another idea, right? So are they first and foremost focusing on the primary like economic benefits, family benefits, et cetera, um, but before growth needs and that growth needs together with the deficiency needs can be simultaneous motivators, meaning they can occur concurrently, right? So it may not be that they're mutually exclusive, it may be that they're mutually inclusive, um, which I think actually might be somewhat unique to sectors like agritourism. This is a theory I have, but anyway. Um, and then the other hypothesis, growth needs may become more salient before deficiency needs, and that the satisfaction of a growth need may sometimes be a necessary condition 
for a deficiency need to be satisfied. So that's maybe sounds like a lot of gobbledygook, but what we're trying to say there is a lot, what we've seen from these surveys and from lots of research is that agritourism entrepreneurs often come at this because they have other goals and objectives that matter to them. And they may actually take priority, i.e. I wanna educate young children about X, right? Or I want to encourage my community to understand about sustainable land practices, right? Or whatever, whatever it is. So technically that is not a deficiency need, right? That is this idea of you know, self-actualization or esteem need. That's a higher level need. And so the idea then is, is that it could be that some agritourism entrepreneurs come at that first, right? They come at needs like that and then fill in these deficiency needs, right? And so the idea is, is that the motivating factors are compl complex, right? And so trying to pick that apart a little bit because people are complex. <laughs> so, um, so the model, I'm sorry, the study. So just to reiterate what, what Will mentioned is um, Lisa Chase and her team at the University of Vermont um, did a national survey. And as Will mentioned, they had collaborators from all around the country. Um, online survey responses from November 2018 to February 2019. And it was a big data set, 1,834 respondents from all 50 states, huge data set. Um, and there are four primary categories. So obviously demographic and firmographic, geographic region, experience offerings and products and motivations. So that's where that's where we came in. <laughs> um, and there's been a number of research products from the survey. Um, in addition to the survey itself, there was, um, gosh, I'm trying to remember how many very detailed interviews, 22, I'm, I may be forgetting the exact number, but very detailed interviews of farmers in about 10 or 12 states. Uh, I mean, very detailed um, interviews of farmers. So there's some really interesting um, research outputs and practical understanding that is coming from that research. Okay, so the model, so I don't wanna get into the weeds, so you can just ignore that mess. Um, but <laughs> just let me just tell you what you're looking at there. Um, so we considered eight agritourism motivations under the entrepreneurial motivation category. Increase revenue, provide family employment. So these should all seem pretty obvious diversify market channels, diverse, diversify offerings, okay, farm offerings, increase traffic to on-farm sales, thank you, um, enjoy social interactions with the public, build goodwill in the community, and educate the public about agriculture, okay, that all probably makes sense, so we were testing all of those motivations, okay, and um, that, so all of that were, all of these were things that we were going to try to test, and we used a structural equation model to do that, as well as several other modeling techniques that I do not need to go into. Okay, so we can go to the next slide, and I'll talk a little bit more about what the summary of the results are. Okay, so looking at Maslow's, or using Maslow's hierarchy of needs as a framing tool for understanding um, these motivations. So physiologic needs, okay? So what we found is uh, higher success to increase revenue increases the motivational importance to diversify offerings, okay? So more success at increased revenue, uh, more motivation to diversify your offerings. Um, it reduces the importance of agritourism to educating the public about agriculture though, right? So the one, this one motivation may then take some priority over something else. It was an insignificant impact on other motivations. However, we also found that higher success in providing family employment increases the motivational importance of agritourism to diversify market channels and offerings and to increase traffic to on-farm sales. Now, this one I think is fascinating in terms of the employment side of this, kind of the workforce side of this. Um, so how do you actually provide more employment? Well, you've got to you got to do more, <laughs> right? You got to do more somehow. And so that's an interesting thing that might be worthy of a, a bit more dipping our toes into. So safety needs, um, higher success in increasing traffic to on-farm sales outlets increases the motivation um, or the importance of agritourism to enjoy social interaction with the public. 
and build goodwill. This was a this piece uh, or these pieces, if you will, were very important to people. The the goodwill piece, the relationship with the public, and how that played into the motivating their primary or even secondary motivational type factors. Um, and then other safety needs, um, diversifying market channels further supports this idea um, to educate the public about agritourism. So um, love and belonging and esteem needs to this similarly, um, higher success if you enjoyed interacting with the public, obviously the motivational importance to you, um, that was motivationally important to you to build goodwill in your community and educate the public. Um, so there's this sort of self a fulfilling prophecy with some of these, probably in terms of some degree of success. And then esteem needs higher success in building goodwill in the community increases the motivational importance also of educating the public. Okay, so just brief discussion. Um, there were a number of things that we found from um, the results that, that gave us some opportunities to think about future research and conclusions, but um, Motiv there were a whole range of motivations that did not have statistically significant relationship with profitability, but operator issues with cash flow, capital availability, and any kind of insurance were obviously less profitable. This one, I th this fourth um, bullet here, I thought was interesting. Greater challenges with labor competition or taxes were more profitable than those with fewer challenges. So that one, obviously, we need to dig into a little bit because that would be kind of contrary to what one might think. Uh, so there may be some confounding things that we haven't um, dug into there. Uh, those who plan on hiring new employees are more profitable. I thought that was interesting. Um, and that there's actually some research just in general on entrepreneurship, separate from agritourism, that has that shows similar types of results. So that may have something to do with kind of the business planning and the proposed growth of the firm and things like that. So that's something else to dig into that also may go back to that workforce kind of development piece. Um, so in general, um, there's a number of ways that we hope to kind of extend this research. Um, when we first started this, we thought there would be a direct path to using um, Shane's model of, of motivation. Um, we ended up having to do some different things with the data. So we would like to explore some of these different pieces of the motivating factors. Uh, we'd also like to explore some, some of it looking at different demographic pieces because we have a lot of that data as well. Um, but in general, I, um, I feel like it's a fast, it was a fascinating way to think about what's motivating people in a sector where people are often coming at this, not just from an income perspective, obviously that may be important, but there's many other important reasons why people come at something like being an agritourism entrepreneur. So I think that's it. Um, yeah, so thank you. Uh, my name is Lori Dickus. I'll be here all week. I know. Um, 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 but I, my, um, I don't have my email up there, but my have cards, so I'm happy to give out cards, but feel free to reach out or find me at the conference. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks. I didn't stay in one spot either. Sorry about that. Hi, uh, thanks for that. Um, I wanted to know, uh, well, kind of two part is who funds this research, and and then and then what are what are your hopes of now that you've gathered all of this? Like, what what are you hoping to do with that? Well, so okay, good question. Okay, so I think everybody heard the question. Um, who funds it? So the the study, the original study, Lisa's study, was funded by USDA. And there's um, a group of us, that arena that Emilio mentioned, there's a group of us, this kind of working collaborative, I would call it, um, that share data and opportunities for research and collaborate around that. And so, um, so nobody funded this study specifically. I just have grad students. <laughs> <laughs> who helped me with it. Um, so, but the original study was funded by Lisa. And then there's just, you know, we, there, like you could see, there's a long list of people who, who will help with it. Yeah, so join us. <laughs> oh, oh, thank you. Um, 
Well, this paper is almost done. And I'm hoping this paper will go in the Journal of Rural Studies. Um, obviously it's got some more cleanup to do. Um, but, um, and obviously there's practical things that could happen with this, something like this, that hopefully we will be able to spin off because many of my colleagues like Dave will be in the back and Will and others are in extension, either you know, full-time or part-time. So I do think there's a lot of opportunities there too. And well, and Lisa is as well. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you for saying that, yeah. Anybody have a question? Oh, firm. Thank you. Oh, and I didn't see you. Ben also is six cented. Uh, firmographic is basically the equivalent of the demographics, but for a firm. Like, what are the firm characteristics, basically? Yeah. Good question. Anybody else? And if anybody wants to talk about structural equation modeling over cocktails, I'm more than happy to. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> As you mentioned that you will publish it in a, in a paper, in a quite high level paper, um, do you think uh, there is an issue with the theory of Maslow? Uh, well, yeah. um, and you mean using the theory? Yeah, so, you know, to be honest, when we, um, it, made, it made a lot of sense when we first started doing it, you know how that goes. <laughs> it sounds like a great idea. Um, we have some, a lot, we have a lot more cleanup to do on that end. And it may be in the end that we, we don't focus on it as much as I presented here. Um, so um, that that may be the result because I do see some problem. I mean, there's not direct connectivity, right? I mean, there's is more of a, a sort of an intuition kind of thing. Yeah, so the answer is yes. And I think for actual publication, it may be that it's more of an inspiration type of thing. Does that answer it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks everybody. Have a great day.